interesting. Oh, hi, everybody. I think, hope everybody can hear me. If you can't hear me, just put a thing in the chat and we'll take care of it. My name is Morty Oberstein. I'm CMO of Rank Ranger, and we're going to get started talking about content, core updates, um, what the core updates mean for creating content, and a little bit about the actual um, update going on right now. Just a quick note, um, or two quick notes. One is I talk really fast. I don't like doing the whole monotone. It's a it's a podcast or it's a speech or it's a webinar. Let's be calm. I'm like a lot of energy, really fast. So really sorry if I'm going too fast, but I'm trying not to. Also, it's about bedtime for my kids right now. So if there's like a large amount of screaming, I apologize in advance. Um, with that, I'm gonna share my slides. Give me one quick second. And then we're gonna get going. Pull that up. Okay. Welcome to creating content in the core update era. My name is Morty Oversee. I'm the CMO of Rank Ranger. We're one of the SEO tools, SEO softwares, rank trackers. I'm also the host of the In Search SEO podcast, which you can find wherever great podcasts are found. New episodes every Tuesday. You can look it for on the Rank Ranger blog, Stitcher, Spotify, SoundCloud. Great guests, biggest names in SEO. Great insights, so definitely check that out. I'm also, uh, one of the hosts for SEO Chat is a Twitter chat, so hashtag SEO Chat. That happens every Thursday, 1 p.m. Eastern time um, on Twitter. So meet some new people in the Twitter space, get some new ideas. And if you really want to follow up this webinar, as soon as we're done, check out Nikki Mosher. She is hosting tonight or today, whatever time it is for you. Okay, let's get going here. Today's agenda, we're going to go through some of the data on the core updates. We're going to do a bit of a thematic analysis, going through some of the sites or one site in particular, trying to show what the core updates are really sort of doing. And then we're going to lead into a, an approach to developing content now that we're in the core update era. And I know you want actionable tips. What's this whole thing about an approach? I will offer actionable tips. They will be there. However, I actually have seven of them for you, I think. I'd rather build a foundation that you understand where, uh, what the core updates are about, what they're trying to do, what Google's trying to do with them, what they actually mean, so that you can take that understanding and apply it to whatever you do. Because I can offer you seven tips. I can offer you 70 tips. I can offer you 70 million tips. But they may not apply to exactly what you're doing or exactly how you need them. So I'd rather offer you a foundational understanding so that you can take that and apply that however you need to apply that. Okay. Um, let's go into how the core updates are different because they are very different than your average unconfirmed update. Google rolls out unconfirmed updates once, twice, three times a month, much smaller events, and they're very different in numerous ways in the core updates. First off, core updates are way more impactful, way more volatile. Um, comparing your average unconfirmed update to your average core update, again, every unconfirmed update is different, every core, every core update is different. However, on average, the, the core updates are 93% more volatile across the top 10 results on the SERP. To highlight this, uh, what you're looking at is a, is a volatility trend chart from June 2015 all the way through the end of 2019. Okay, the spikes up are increases in stability, the spikes down are decreases in stability or increases in rank volatility, if that makes it easier for you to understand. And what you're looking at here is just data on the very first results on the SERP for the health needs. So health queries, health sites, first results only. So as you can see, if you go from you know, 2015 all the way through the um, summer of 2018, there's okay, there's your ups, there's your downs. It's relatively stable. It's the first result on the SERP. It's your Wikipedia's, Mayo Clinic's, WebMDs of the world. Very stable. However, if you notice the core update error starts creeping in, which I've labeled with those boxes over there, the volatility gets way, way, way more out of control. In fact, that that dip down that I've indicated with the medic update, that is how far, how impactful the medic update was on the top result on the SERP for the health needs, which is why we call it the medic update because there's nothing been like it before and nothing like it afterwards. And this just goes to show you just how significant the core updates are, different than your average unconfirmed update. Pardon me while I parch my throat. Okay. Since we are currently in the middle of a core update, the May 2020 core update, aptly named, because we're in May and it's a core update, um, here's the volatility, here's the rank fluctuations of the most right two lines. Are the rank fluctuations over the last two days? Uh, three days, actually. Well, you don't have the third day here. Today kind of uh, went back down to normal. These are the two days of the actual update itself. The first day you can see is not at that out of control, but the second most right bar 
that's yesterday's um that's um may 5th data rather not so out of control compared to april 10th or may 2nd or may 2nd it's bigger but not that much bigger where you see may 6th the update really kicked in let me show you okay, these are the rate volatility increases per niche for day one of the update top three results top five results top 10 results yes okay let's take the top three results that first section over there you're looking at for the travel niche a 20 percent increase in rate volatility 19 for the retail niche and so forth that's big that's bigger than your average under from the update but that is not core update big at all let's take a look at the full update period now whereas before the top three results we saw i'll go back to it 20 17 percent 12 percent volatility increases now you're talking about 30 40 upper 40 percent rank volatility increases when you go to the top 10 results you're looking at 90 percent increases in rank volatility that this is one of the most impactful core updates i've seen it is bigger just to put it into perspective the january 2020 core update was big it was a massive update this is way i mean not way bigger this slightly edges out the january 2020 core update that puts it right up there like in medic update territories this is a very big update Going back to how the core updates differ from the unconfirmed updates. Okay, they're different in what they focus on. They're different in that they have a focus in and of itself. Specifically referring to YMYL, the core updates in general, not a, you know, as a rule, because every update again is different, the core updates generally hit YMYL harder than the uh, unconfirmed updates. In fact, the YMYL niches, health, finance, see 66% more volatility during a core update than the non-YMYL niches. However, this particular update, going back a second, is not that way, which makes this update unique in another way, that YMYL and non-YMYL are all basically in the same ranges of volatility increases. But in general, YMYL sees far more volatility during a core update than your non-YMYL um, your, your non categories. With that, and if you're a baseball fan, you get this. I will say there's a bunch of um, obscure, um, out of left field pop culture references. If you don't get them, that's on me. I just enjoy it. So apologies in advance. However, knowing that the core updates focus on YMYL leads us to ask, okay, what can we learn from that? What does that say um, about the core updates? How does that speak to what the core updates are doing or why Google's rolling them out or what the core updates are really meant to be achieving? Um, by the mere fact that they hit YMYL harder than non-YMYL. Now, the first thing to realize is, and Google has said this, they are not out to get your money, your life, websites, health, finance. They're not specifically trying to target them with the core update, despite the fact that the core updates do tend to hit them harder. That's because, and, and we know this because, the so besides Google saying it, in case you don't trust Google, the data in the other niches, the non-YMYL niches, show us very similar patterns. Like qualitatively speaking, the core updates impact the, the non-YL and the YMYL niches the same way. It's just a different extent. The YMYL niches get hit harder, but the, the, the non-YMYL non niches, that's a tongue twister, um, they get hit in the same way qualitatively. So everybody's in the same boat, it's just YMYL gets hit uh, to a greater extent, there's more volatility is what I mean. The, the nature of the volatility is the same, which again leads us to ask, what in the heck is going on? Why is YM getting hit? And what does that teach us? So the answer is um, apl applicability. Why and why all niches, health and finance get hit harder during the core update? Because they are more applicable to what the core updates are intending to do, to the very purpose, the very nature of the core updates. In order to show you what in the heck that means, because that's a very obtuse statement, uh, I want to go through a particular website and show you how is the core updates have played itself out and why I think the core updates have impacted that site in particular, uh, or that kind of site in particular. Okay, so what you're looking at here is draxcom or drakes.com, because there's no period in a URL, so brilliant in that sense. Um, this website has gotten hit, clobbered, absolutely clobbered by the medic update, by numerous core updates, it's all a bit of a rebound during the January 2020 core update. Uh, and that's because what I'm about to show you, he scaled back on just a bit. Um, and, and Google rewarded him. Although, even with the increase at the January 2020, 
is not anywhere near where the levels of, of uh, brain visibility um, and traffic that it was before. That said, I'm pretty sure, if I remember this correctly, during um, COVID-19, as the pandemic started rolling out around March 11th, when it was officially named the pandemic, so Google killed them off again, which makes good sense. Anyway, uh, he is a health information site. He is all about making you uh, live better, be better, healthier, whatever. Let me show you what every single page looks like or looked like prior to some of the changes he made in January. You start off on a page. It's about, again, health information site, live better, be better, feel better, everything about your life better. And you start with a banner right on the right-hand side. Scroll down the page, and you are given another banner ad about repairing your leaky gut. I don't know what a leaky gut is. That does not sound good. Scroll down the page. You finish the article, and your reward are two handsome pictures of Dr. Axe, all about free access to his course or essential oils or whatever he's pitching. You go down even further past the related articles, no banner ad. Now, before you jump on me and say, well, okay, well, this site got clobbered because there's so many ads. It's about, it's an ad quality update. No, it's not. Um, sites with CTAs, too many CTAs, particularly informational sites with too many CTAs, um, inf informational sites with too many affiliate links, informational sites with too many internal links pointing towards a product. Got hit the same way. So different scam, same problem. So what's going on? The issue with Dr. Axe's site and sites like that with too many CTAs and the affiliate links and the whatnot um, is that Google's not sure what the real identity of the site is. Like when you look at the site, in order to ask you, hey, what is this site? Is it a health information site? I don't know. Kind of looks like it's an e-commerce site. Is it an e-commerce site? Is it an informational site? Is it an informational site with a you know covert um, operation to get you to buy something? It's, so it's really like a you know, clandestine e-commerce site. There's a very um, strong conflict in these sites' identities, which is a problem because Google is profiling sites. Google's looking at sites asking, who are you? What are you doing? What are you meant to be doing? And are you doing what you're meant to be doing? In other words, Google is asking, what is your identity? Google's asking if you have identity. Are you all over the place talking about too many different things? Do you have a core identity? Do you, if you do have a core identity, are you actually living up to what you say you are? In the case of Dr. X, no. Like clearly, he's not really just an informational site. He's clearly trying to push you to buy his products. Another way to think about this is like Google's entity understanding. In fact, it is Google's entity understanding. Your site is an entity. Google is analyzing your site just like it would another entity. Who are you? What's your identity? What does it mean to be you? So with that, we still haven't figured out, okay, what, okay, I, we get it, right? Google is doing this awesome thing, profiling sites, asking what your identity is, seeing if there's a conflict in identity, and slamming sites that have a conflict in identity. Still does not answer why YMYL is getting clobbered any more than non-YMYL. Let's play this out. Let's say Google's right. What's the problem with having a conflict in identity? I don't know who you are, right? I, I, I don't know what you are. Again, are you an informational site? Are you a commerce site? I don't know who you are. Who are you really? And that brings up a whole bunch of questions. If, we, I, don't, if I can't trust who you say you are, I can't trust you. I, I, you're not an authority. Did you see, by the way, this is the beauty of this. All, all of the, you know, the past recent months, the EAT equation, that um, expertise, authoritativeness, and trustworthiness has sort of entered the, the SEO world like a bad end of hell. And it makes total sense because as Google is starting to profile sites, as Google is looking at sites asking, hey, who are you? And, and is, are, you, are you who you really say you are? If you're not, that brings up questions like, can I trust you, trustworthiness, right? So it all plays out perfectly. Let's, so let's, let's actually take us to a logical conclusion. We have two sites. One's YMYL, one's not YMYL. Let's say Google's right. Let's say Google's right. I can't actually trust you. Well, what's the worst that happens? In each case, with a YMYL site, with a non-YMYL site, and from there you'll see why YMYL gets clobbered. Let's say you're a health site. And Google is right about you. We cannot trust you. You're really, you're not writing content to help me. You're just writing content because you want to push your commerce profile. Well, what's the worst that can happen if your content's not authoritative or trustworthy? Um, you could kill people. Literally, you could end up people. This has actually happened during the COVID-19 crisis. Someone got wrong information, not from a website, from a news conference, took the wrong medicine, and died. Okay, so there's serious implications for this. Let's take a non-YMYL site. I don't know, sports news sites. 
assuming you're not betting on sports in excessive amounts, which I do not recommend as a source of income, what's the worst that happens if the information can't be trusted? If I'm not really writing great content, I'm just writing the content so I have a place to put my ads. Worst that happens is I get bad sports analysis. I get the wrong score. Like here, the Steelers beat the Rams 871 to 12. Now, for those of you who don't know American football, scoring 871 points in a single game is not possible. Which, by the way, goes to show you, do not trust screenshots because I just manipulated the HTML to adjust the score. My point is it makes sense why Google would hit a YMYL site more under the contract of the core update. Because a non-YMYL site, if it's wrong, if it, I'm sorry, if it's not trustworthy, if it's not authoritative, it's wrong. That's not good. That's bad. Like things should not be wrong. Things should be right. That's self-evident. However, love that monkey shot. Um, if a YMYL site cannot be trusted, if it is not authoritative, if it has a conflicted identity, that could be dangerous. Does it make sense to treat a site that can be dangerous by being unauthoritative just the way uh, as a site that is wrong or uh, offers bad information. No. So same thing is Google's doing the same thing to both sites, profiling them, analyzing if they're authoritative, analyzing if they're trustworthy. But Google's going to way further extents, as it should, in killing rankings for YMYL sites because when you're not, when you lack an identity or a complicated identity, that can be dangerous. This all points to Google being all in on authority. And I want to take a minute because it's really, really important, I think, to understand why Google is so into authority, why Google has doubled down on authority with the core updates. I totally don't need that slide. Here it is. Um, it's because Google, Google is not a search engine. Okay, I have a whole post on this on the Rank Ranger blog. Check it out. Um, Google's not a search engine. It is not an answer engine. I know everyone thought Google's an answer engine. Google's about providing it. No, it's not. Okay, Google is an authority engine. Google is just like any other website. Authority is paramount to Google. If, uh, if Google's not authoritative, Google's not trustworthy, users will bounce and go to Bing. They'll go to DuckDuckGo. They'll go to Yahoo. They'll go to wherever. They will not go back to Google. They will not go back to Google. They will not see ads. They will not click on ads. They will not earn ad revenue. Authority is the commodity that gets users to Google. Google is very much an authority engine. And the fact that it gives direct answers that's all part of the authority equation. If I am a source of knowledge, I'm giving you direct information, that makes me very authoritative if I'm Google. So Google's all in an authority. And now you know you're saying, okay, can we please just get to the content tips? This is very nice, very abstract, very conceptual, really good underpinning of what's going on with the core updates and what the core updates are trying to do, but please just give me the content tips. That's why I'm sitting here. No, I will not, because we still have to understand um, to the extent of which Google is profiling sites, analyzing sites, and looking at sites holistically via their identity, much like it would an entity. During the September 2019 core update, one of the interesting things that I saw were a bunch of loan sites that got in. And I, I checked out these loan sites. I totally forget which loan site this is at this point. Um, it's a very much informational site. It's all a strictly informational site for the most part. This is a page meant to tell you um, what a business term loan is. In other words, before I take a massive loan and ruin my credit, I don't be I'm not able to pay it back, before I enter financial ruin, possibly, I need to understand what the hell this loan is. So what is a business term loan? Well, this page is written by a used car salesperson because it reads like this. A business term loan never goes out of style. We all love a classic because it's tried and true. We know it'll work for us time and time again. This is pure schlock. This is pure marketing. Um, jargon. This does not tell me what a business term loan is, as opposed to this page, which did not get hit by that update. Simple, secure small business loan. What is it? Oh, a secure or collateralized small business loans include equipment, loans, factoring, and merchant cash advances. I know exactly what this is. I mean, assuming I know what the heck I'm, I'm actually reading. Very informational, very straightforward, very much not the marketing schlock that we just saw with this page. It makes sense why this one didn't get killed. In other words, Google's good. Google's really good. And looking at a site, profiling site, in this particular case, it looked at tone. I mean, backhandedly, albeit, but Google is looking at tone. And saying, okay, the tone you took for that informational page, that was kind of marketing. 
Are you a marketing site? Are you an informational site? Are you a marketing page? Are you an informational page? We can't trust you. Goodbye rankings. That's very, very nuanced. So we have to be very, very careful how we think about this and how we construct this. Now we can start getting to the tips. Now we can start looking at what the good, the bad, and the authoritative content looks like. Really good and authoritative are synonymous, but I could not have done a good, bad, and ugly um, remake. It was just the, the, the authority and the bad. That wouldn't make any sense. The good, the bad, and the authority. Side note, by the way, when Google has talked about the core updates, they've said, oh, okay, the only thing you need to do if you are still relevant for the query, because sometimes it's about user behavior has changed, intent has changed, you're just not relevant anymore. There's really nothing you can do about that besides writing new content or adjusting the content. But where your content is good and it's relevant, the only thing you can do is continue to write good content. So when Google says that, I know everybody in the SEO would get all upset about this. It is true. The only thing you can do is write authoritative content. Of course, the question is the, the devil's in the details. What does that actually mean? Because writing authoritative content now versus writing authoritative content five years ago are not the same thing. So what does it look like now to write authoritative content now that Google is so good at understanding authority? So let's start off with some of the common misconceptions and understand what authoritative content is not. It is not links. I know like five of you just had a heart attack. It's not links. But yes, I am not saying links are not a major ranking signal. I am saying that you should not care about links. I am saying that when it comes down to the concept of authority, links are not authority. Links are part of the process. It's part of the foundation of the way Google understands. Yes, but it's not what authority is per se. Um, it's not author bios. Not saying you shouldn't have an author bio. You should have an author bio, particularly when your author is an entity of itself that Google recognizes in the knowledge panel. Very helpful. But that's not what authority is. Uh, that's not what authority is. That's very top level. That doesn't really go into what authority actually is. Neither are professionally reviewed content pieces. Right when you run a piece of medical content, you have a doctor to review it. Wow, I'm so authoritative. Doctor reviewed by content. Yeah, you should do that if you're running health content. Very good. Totally do that. But that does not get into what authority is fundamentally. Sorry, talk a lot, dry throat, one sec. Okay, authority is everything. Authority is ethereal. Authority is almost ineffable. Big words, I know. Um, authority includes everything about your site, the UX, the UI, the content, the layout, how you, everything about your site, the links, everything about your site speaks to your authority. So the question now is, if Google is focusing in on authority with the core update, it's profiling the site to see if you're authoritative, to see if you're safe, to see if you're trustworthy, and all that good jazz, what does it actually mean to find the right tone, the right authority, the right content beat, given now how Google is looking at the content world? I will boil this down to one thing, and we'll segment this out, which is where the tips will come in. Authority, having authoritative content is you have mastered whatever it is you're talking about. You have exhibited um, mastery over the topic. You are a master of this topic. That is authority. If you're authoritative, it means you've exhibited mastery. It's synonymous. Does it really tell us what exactly we need to do? Okay, so how do you break up mastery? What, what does mastery consist of? You're talking about I have mastery over a topic that I'm writing about or a focus that I'm writing about or dealing with on my site. What does it actually look like? And now we get to your tips. By the way, I have seven tips for you. I'm gonna do, I think, five. I'm gonna jump back to some theory, and we're gonna get into some really nitty gritty stuff, and then I'll jump back to the final two tips. It'll all make sense, just, just bear with me. Um, number one, you have to have a focus. If, you, if identity and authority are synonymous concepts, you have to have a content focus. Okay, just, you cannot, it should go without saying, but you cannot target high search volume keywords for the sake of targeting high search volume keywords if they don't reflect what you write about or what your site is about or who you are. I would even say those keywords that sit on the periphery, those topics that sit on the periphery, that you're like, yeah, they sort of fit into what I talk about. They sort of don't fit into what I talk about. Don't go after it. That takes away from your focus, from your identity. Also, number two, mastery consists of taking a topic from different perspectives, different angles, different facets, different subtopics, different areas. You're giving a comprehensive understanding, a comprehensive view, a broad view of what this topic consists of through multiple pieces that tackle the topic, that, top, that tackle the issue from multiple perspectives, again, from multiple vantage points uh, in multiple ways. Um, and number three, at multiple 
levels. If you are a master of your content area, if I am a Kung Fu master, I can do Kung Fu to the most advanced Kung Fu person in the whole world. I can also teach Kung Fu to some guy in the street. If you understand your content area, if you are a master, an authority in that area, you can explain that area to the most, you know, to the simpleton. You can explain it to the most advanced person in the whole world. You should write to multiple levels to exhibit mastery and therefore authority over your content area. Four, um, and this is a, a hot topic every once in a while in the SEO world, you need to be consistent. I'm not saying you need to write a post once a week on a calendar. What I am saying is if you want to be an authority, you have to be an active member of the conversation. There's no way that you're an authority on the area, but you're not really part of the conversation. You have to keep active, you have to be active, an active member of the conversation in whatever content area that you're talking about, particularly when it's a hot topic that's evolving, such as COVID-19, for example. Consistent content might be very important in that moment. Number five, and after this, we're gonna go into some uh, uh, underpinnings again. Number five, watch your freaking mouth. Like you saw before, tone matters not just tone there's a lot of different things you have to consider about how your content sounds and, and almost feels and let me explain what i mean here because uh, creating appropriate content is a very complex matter so let's like you know catch up we understand what the corrupt leads are doing they are analyzing sites profiling sites according to their identity looking for strong identity which is strong authority looking for problems with the authority or conflicts in the authority which means you need to create authoritative content, which means you have to exhibit mastery. The problem is there's a, uh, what, what might be authoritative or what might be good for one piece of content for one topical area might not be good for another area. There are multiple ways to exhibit authority. There are multiple levels of authority. There might, you might exhibit the highest level of authority and it might not it might be completely inappropriate for the content you're writing. I'll give you a quick um, breakdown. You can find breaks in way more ways than this. The two main ways this breaks down is academics versus experience, right? Let's just take a case. Um, I'm going to stick with a lot of health queries because it's very easy to see the concepts within the health um, field. But if you take it out of health, the, the same thing applies. Let's say I'm looking for, um, I want to understand how cells metastasize when I have cancer. Okay? I do not want content from somebody, some guy who has cancer. I want someone who knows what they're talking about. I want the top doctor from Johns Hopkins who's been studying this thing for the last 50 million years to tell me how cancer works. If, however, I do not want to know that. I want to know, how do you live, oops, sorry, hit the wrong button. How do I live my life to the fullest if I'm undergoing chemotherapy? I don't want some doctor who's never had cancer to go tell me what they think. That's kind of offensive. What I want rather is I want someone who has experienced undergoing chemotherapy to tell me how they dealt with this. There's different levels of authority, different types of authority that are appropriate for different moments. And it's a major, major consideration when you're writing content that you might be saying, like, you're just totally making this up. Where did you pull that out of? Well, one, it's common sense. Okay, if I if I want something experiential, if it, it's basic intent, if my intent is asking for experience, then I should get experiential content. If my intent is asking for something academic, I should get something academic. Back. By the way, just goes to show you that intent is way more complicated than just transactional, um, informational navigation. Intent breaks down way, 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 way more refined categories, and that's one of the shortcomings of the SEO industry. But that's a totally different topic. The other way I know this is because during the medic update, or around the same time, not during, at the same time, uh, general vicinity of the medic update, Google released a, um, a piece of a, a patent. Okay? And the patent talks about how it can classify sites according to what kind of sites they are, health site, this site. And it goes into how it weighs different factors, or how it could, if Google implemented the patent, how it could weigh different factors depending upon how Google classified the content. Bill Slossy is a wonderful piece about this, I'm summarizing it. One of the aspects of that patent is that Google looks to see um, if, if the patent speaks to different levels of authority or different levels of, of experience. Does a user want experience versus a more abstract understanding? It actually speaks to this. So that's how I know. By the way, another way how you know is that during the COVID-19 um, pandemic, which is still, of course, 
ongoing and hope you're doing well with this. <clears throat> Pardon me. Google said that when you write health content, you should make sure that the lay person understands. In other words, Google said you should not write hyper authoritative, super complex, throw in a bunch of medical terms. You want the app. This is a, a plague that that impacts everybody. So the content that you write, all things being equal, obviously, because certain types of content should not be this way, should speak to the average person who has to deal with this. So that's how you know. That said, how do you know, in case you're still wondering, how do I know how authoritative should I go or what type of authority should I create when I am creating content? Well, common sense. Like if you're talking about something experiential, then write with an experiential authority, right? If you're talking about something academic, make sure you have somebody who knows what the heck they're talking about writing it. However, if that line is still blurry, Whatever your whatever keywords relate to your content, the main keyword that relates to your content, run it through Google. And if Google returns Reddit and Quora, all the forums, then you know Google looks at that keyword and says the intent here is experiential. Because I can tell you something about Quora or Reddit. There's not a lot of real experts on there. So if Google's returning forums, that means they want experiential, and that's what you should write. That said, if you really want to get into how to know how authoritative, what type of tone, what type of authority your content should take, there is another way, and that is by looking at the super authorities. Every industry has them. You know them. They are the sites that you want to destroy, kill, and blow up because you cannot outrank them. Every industry has them. Most notable, I guess, is the health industry, so I'll use a health example. right? You have the Mayo Clinic, WebMD, Harvard Health, Hopkins, you know, the CDC, and a government site from the health department, whatever. Super authorities, those are sites where Google says, we know what they're writing is content worthy, it is trustworthy. Not only that, John Mueller has actually spoken to this. And he has said, what Google does is they, they look at how um, certain pieces of, of content are being written, that's the super authorities, and, and, and they analyze how that content is being written, what, what goes into writing that content, and they determine what content for that topic should sound like for everybody else. One of the ways that you can get into and see how the super authorities are, are handling their content, there are many ways. I am just going to go show you one way. I was like, oh, I can do that. Yes, you can. There are many ways you can do this. One very simple way is just doing a site search. So I'll show you an example here. Cancer and diet was the keyword. Uh, I picked the WebMD, WebMD to be my, my super authority. And I just took a look at the titles. You can actually go into the content, look at the treating the content. Recommend if you really want to get into it. But I just wanted a quick glance. How did WebMD deal with this keyword? I'll tell you how they dealt with it. Very straightforward, very informational heading uh, titles with no filler or fluff. Cancer diet, eating right when you have cancer. The anti-cancer diet, eating well during cancer treatment, as opposed to Dr. X. Yes, he's back. Right? Same keyword, diet and cancer, and you get something that sounds like it came off some of an SEO blog somewhere. Top 12 cancer-fighting foods and other natural remedies. 10 cancer uh, natural cancer treatments to consider. It sounds like five ways to build backlinks, 10 ways to audit your content, which, by the way, might be totally fine for the SEO space. You might do a site search for the most authoritative, the most best SEO news site on the planet and get things that sound like 10 ways to do this, five ways to do that, and that could be fine for that vertical, for that topic. But for this topic, Google clearly does not want top 12, top 12 cancer. I don't want that. I want something that sounds like cancer diet, eating right, okay? So that's one way to do this. There is another problem. If we're saying, I just run it through again. Google's all about authority, looking at profiling your site, understanding who your site is, understanding its identity, understanding what that means for your authority. You have identity, you have authority. Looking for conflicts in authority, you need to create authoritative content, masterful content. Well, if Google's all about authority, masterful content, then wouldn't Google just want to pick the super authorities and just rank them all the time? And the answer is yes. Here's eating healthy during pregnancy. Top level, high search volume keyword, kind of keyword we all drool over. What's ranking here? Peter Snippet, WebMD.com, second result, MarchofDimes.org, major nonprofit on this issue. Health.gov, government, super authorities all the way down the page. In fact, I'm in the middle of a study, not releasing the numbers here. You'll have to wait. I have no idea when it's coming out. It's on my contact calendar at some point. For 
in the health niche or these highly authoritative niches, Google, almost for all these top level queries, it's like 70% of the results are chewed up with these organizations, um, super authority sites, government sites, that sort of thing. There's not much room to rank. So great, Morty, you're telling me all these tips about how to write masterful content, authoritative content. What the hell's the point if I can't rank anywhere? So what can you do? I am here to tell you that you can do nothing. There is nothing you can do. Of course, I am not saying for any given keyword, it's not competitive, blah, blah, blah. Yes, I understand that. I am talking across the board. You are never, never going to be WebMD or the Mayo Clinic unless you actually open up a Mayo Clinic. And even if you do, it will take you years to build up that level of authority. So there is nothing you can do. Sorry to say, woe is me. Can't believe I sat through a half hour with this guy telling me there's nothing to do. I'm being a little bit hyperbolic because there is something you could do. You could pull the Joe name, the Joe Willie name, the Broadway Joe, and go long down the field. I'm talking long tail keyboards. If you go long, there is a world of a difference. Okay, I, this is a keyword my sister gave me who is currently pregnant. I asked her, give me a keyword you would actually search for. The topic you were searching for, and she gave me, are hot dogs with nitrates a problem during pregnancy? Yes, I forgot the S in dogs, but it's the same thing. Okay, what do you get here? WebMD, Mayo Clinic, Health.gov? No. You get whattoexpect.com in the future snippet. LittleOneMag.com, WorkingMother.com. These are all very niche-specific boutique sites. Okay, these are not your WebMDs of the world. These are not even general health sites, like Health.com, Very Well Health. Okay, these are very specific to pregnancy. In other words, when there's long tail, when you go, forget the SEO terms, when you go deeper into a topic, the super authorities are not as relevant. Those are very broad sites. They're not going into the, can you eat a hot dog with nitrates during pregnancy? However, there are niche sites. When Google has these queries, it prefers niche sites that have a particular focus, in this case, pregnancy, which come in a full circle here. It's exactly what we spoke about before. These sites have a very strong focus. They have mastered a particular topic, pregnancy. This is what they focus on, or motherhood, or whatever it is, parenting, okay? same sort of thing. They have mastered this. They have taken it from multiple perspectives, multiple levels, strong, strong focus. And Google prefers these sites as opposed to the top level queries. It's like something like 60, 70% of these SERPs are filled with sites dedicated to that particular focus. In other words, back to the tips, pop some content Adderall. I know someone's going to ask at some point or something I have in their mind, like, how strong should my focus be? Let's say I'm writing about SEO. I can write about future snippets. I can write about backlinks. I can write technical SEO, content SEO. I can write about a million things about SEO. And I'm not saying you shouldn't. You can go very broad within the same topic, within the same focus. However, every once in a while, write those silos. Write those content pillars. Go deep into a series of content on whether on, on eating hot dogs when pregnant. You have to go that specific. On feature snippets, on whatever it is that you want to talk about. I'm not saying you have to do a series like one week, then on next week, the next week. It doesn't have to be one after the other, but over a you know period of time, write a silo, write a take a you know, make up a content pillar and write a series on a particular subtopic, on a particular facet, on a particular micro focus. And I know people don't like going long tail keywords by not. To, to me, if you're not going to go into the detail, and you're not going to dive into a topic. And again, exhibit mastery, really going into it. There's really not a lot of room to operate in many cases. You're very much limiting yourself these days. Because again, Google loves those super authorities more than ever. Which brings me to our last tip. Like Duran Duran, you've got to be hungry like the wolf. It's not enough to have authority and a focus and everything I've taught you about mastery. You have to, part of the trick is finding where those opportunities are because they are much harder to come by, as we saw. Part of the process is the last part of the process in, in this case um, is being able to dig deep and find where's the opportunity? Where can I focus? Where can I, what can I harp on that maybe some of the bigger sites out there are not getting into? Let me, let me create that multifaceted content for this. Let me create. Um, a silo. Let me create a, a content order that goes into this from multiple perspectives, multiple angles, multiple facets, but find out where those opportunities to do that are. 
and that's all I have. Um, I'm going to answer some questions, so don't 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 go away. But if you want to find me, I'm on Twitter at Morty Overstein. I'm definitely I'm on Twitter way more than I should be. So reach out to me, find me. I love to talk to people. Um, converse with me, and and uh, I hope you enjoy this. And definitely reach out to me. All right, let me uh, let me exit out of this. Goodbye to this. I'm going to turn my screen share off. Okay, I'm back. Um, let's go through a couple of questions. Let me just pull them out here for a quick second. Okay, uh, some people submitted questions. Let me go through the ones that I can answer. Okay, um, someone wrote, what is the minimum interval between postings and how to define topic relevancy relationship? Um, well, like I, like I mentioned before, like you need to keep on trucking, as the slide said, but it doesn't mean, there's no magic formula. You need to be, I would say you need to be active in the conversation. What does it mean to be active in the conversation? Well, you have a general understanding of what that means, right? If you're writing a post like once every other month, it's not really so active. Um, if you write a post once a week, once every other go, you skip a post here, a week that you post. That's not going to be that's not going to be a make or break. Be consistent. Also for your users, it's very important to be consistent. If they expect to post every week, every other week, whatever it is, that that's going to be you know part of the factor. Um, so that's what I have to say about that. Next question: Do you have any views on the best way to structure an FAQ? I mean, I'm assuming you mean FAQ page, not the schema markup. Also, is it better to build one or two very content-rich pages or structure the content over? A number of related pages. Good question. Uh, depends. SEO. If you don't have a lot, if, it, if you have a very linear product or very linear service, just it just makes sense to keep it on one page. Like your users, what are you going to do? You can make multiple pages. You're just going to see two questions. They have to go look somewhere else for another for the rest of the FAQ. That's going to make them crazy. Don't do that. That said, if you have a decent amount of your know, subtopic, I have this aspect of my product. I have another part of my product. Another part. So yeah, make multiple pages. The, the, the one thing I would, and that's great for focus. It's great for telling Google, okay, this is a very specific focus in this FAQ. I would recommend that you can you make it easy for the readers to find the rest of the FAQs. You could make one FAQ hub and like you know siphon users off, you know, uh, FAQ on this aspect, uh, on this, you know, I have a link there and have, or a button there, or FAQs on the other part of your product, or different product that you offer, and have another page. But like one hub where they can actually access the FAQs, that would probably be easier. So that's that. Um, how can our content reach a large audience at this time? I don't believe you mean like at the time of day, probably um, COVID-19. That's a good one. Um, one, you may not be able to in the same way that you were before, and that could just be a reality that you might have very little control over, and that's fine. That could mean that it's time to prepare for afterwards. Use this as, a, as an opportunity to get ahead of the game once you come back or think about coming. By the way, I know everybody's focused on, on what do I do now? I think coming back is going to be a little bit harder than now, especially for local, uh, updating your hours. It's the same hours as COVID. Is this, are these the regular hours now? A lot of, lot of questions coming back. Um, let's see. With COVID, uh, by the way, uh, to that, to uh, a large audience, one is I would say you know, check the tone of what people want. Like I can only speak for myself at the moment. I want things a little bit more um, lighter than, than usual. So maybe you know keep up the uh, – Keep the tone up a little bit, you know, lighter than you than you normally would. Let me just check something here. I'm sorry, something's not right. Okay. Um, let's see with COVID. Okay, this one with COVID nineteen, every business has been affected. Okay, how how can content be boosted? Uh, how how can content be boosted? I'm gonna start reading this. With COVID nineteen, every business has been affected. How can content be boosted? Or how can it boost business again? Okay, um, what types of content are needed now? Okay, how can our content reach a large audience at this time? I work in the tourism industry, and content is my best tool to attract new customers. Okay, that's a good question. Again, let's take let's take tourism. That's a very good one. You need to think about. I just spoke about this with Simon Cox in my last episode of the podcast. So check that out. Because he looked at a couple of sites and he's recommending some of the similar things I'm going to say now um, with the sites that he had. Well, let's take tourism for a second. Okay. One of, the, okay, one of the things I see with my own kids was was um, um, attractions. I think it was like some sort of like archaeological dig. They did a virtual tour of the dig, which was cool. So we got to watch that. Maybe you could post all sorts of virtual tours of, of locations, also the virtual tours, partner up with people, right? I see what you can do virtually. Also, this pops out of the top of my head, finding the right content for, for you might mean different countries are, are coming out of this at different pieces. You could have a, a, a constantly updated page that goes through 
when travel is starting to open up for different pay, for different countries. So again, it's, it's about finding the right opportunity, finding the right audience, and offering them what they need. There are content opportunities out there. You just need to be in tune with what the audience wants. Um, next one. How should I plan to write several pieces of content which use the same keywords to maximize SEO? I think I disagree with the entire premise of this question. I do not think you should be thinking about keywords. Okay? Think about it as topics. So let's ask that question again in terms of topics. How should I plan to write several pieces of content which all use the same topic to maximize SEO? Well, that's easy. We talked about it right here. Talk about you can write um, about different aspects of that topic. You can write a beginner's guide to that topic, or you can write an advanced guide to that topic. So multiple levels, okay? Multiple ways of dealing with the same topic. Think about topics, not keywords. Um, hi, we have been having a problem with content on a medical topic for a long time. Can you give some advice? Not, not without knowing what particular problem is, although I did speak to a lot of medical health queries during the presentation, so hopefully some of that answered it. Uh, let's see, I would like to know more about SEO. Which is the best way to learn? What would you recommend? Ah, I love this question. Um, just spoke about this, ironically, on my last podcast episode also. <clears throat> One thing I recommend is um, forget reading articles. You should read articles, obviously. Play around with the SERP. Do a bunch of queries. Do the same type of queries once a week, once every other day, once a day, and do it on, on, on mobile. Do it on, on desktop. Do it in another market. Do it in the US. Do it in the UK. And see how Google treats the query differently over time. Or see what SERP features are on the page or not on the page. See what are, are, is included within those SERP features or maybe what's not included in those SERP features. So one of the things that stands to mind that I was noticed that I noticed this one the um, like last couple of days was um, you know, Google has a lot of um, SERP features out there now that are asking for user input. They have a SERP feature now where if you don't like the result or if Google's not offering solid results, they offer you a box with search tips and then they offer you two options that you can use. Maybe you should search for this or maybe you should search for this. That's asking for user input, right? There's an A-B test basically. At the same time, Google's running a, uh, a, a search feature where you can submit a question for Google's publishing partners to answer. Again, user input. So watching those trends, you're like, oh, Google's asking for a lot of user input. What does that mean? Is this machine learning hit a wall? Google about to roll something big and looking for, for some input, whatever it is. So looking at the service one way, Obviously, reading, uh, going to sites like SE Roundtable, Barry Schwartz's website, love that website. Um, definitely keep up with what's going on in the news. Um, podcasts like my own podcast, blogs. Um, going out on Twitter and interacting with people. I know it's a little bit scary sometimes, but most of us don't bite it, and the people that bite are jerks anyway, so don't worry about that. Um, what else do I have here? Um, how to write first potential partner if you want to start a new partnership. I'm not sure exactly what you mean by that if you mean how do you like create partners with people i know people are going to tell you like you know like, like say link building which i don't recommend you do unnaturally um it's it's about long-term relationships and i don't have, i don't have a better answer uh, than that it all depends on the particular circumstance at times um someone had a question here about a pbn and i don't somebody asked a question about a pbn i don't know where i put it the answer to that question is don't do pbn uh, next question, how to make more effective tourist site? What blocks should it include? Um, I th it blocks you mean by schema markup or the HTML. Not sure exactly what you mean by that. Um, an effective tourist site, again, it, that's very specific on the vertical, what users want from the particular subtopic, right? From, from, from a tourist site that's an all-inclusive tour package to a tourist site that highlights the best attractions in a local area. It's going to very much depend, and you have to see more on that particular um, site. Um, with that, I don't think there are any more questions. So I thank you very much for tuning in. If you want to reach out to me again, I'm on Twitter. I'm on LinkedIn, at Morty Overstein on Twitter. I thank you very much for tuning in, and be safe, be healthy, and hopefully we'll get through all this crazy crap soon. Thanks so much.